I do not have a prepared talk on the same subject. I speak many places and I, it comes out differently. And I really enjoy the Q&A, which is unique and different each time and very spontaneous. And we will have a nice Q&A, I hope, afterwards. I we'll, will make some opening remarks and then we will have a Q&A. I just want to give you a kind of positioning of this topic of Hindu contributions. And I want to make it relevant for people to be Hindu today. So, it is not something that we do because our ancestors did it, our parents did it, because it is chauvinistic, we can say we, are, we have something of our own. Those may be important reasons for some, but I am I, convinced that uh, it is a very important system and body of knowledge for humanity at large. It is not about being Indian, but it has a, it has a wide range of uh, theories, ideas, practices which have value today. So, I will give you a little snapshot of that. <clears throat> but to give you some of the headlines, uh, and I'm, I write a lot on these, so I can just tell you a little bit now. Hinduism has had huge amounts of contributions to what we now call mind sciences, cognitive sciences, neurosciences, which has just been discovered in the last 30, 40 years. It has become a rave to talk of mindfulness meditation or the effects of yoga or something like that on various things about the body and experiences of higher states of consciousness that people are now able to start measuring and evaluating, things that the rishis and yogis have claimed for a very, very long time. So, this particular area is very cutting edge. Uh, it is very, very much where the new Nobel prizes are going to come and yet it, it involves areas where our tradition has unparalleled expertise. And in fact, it is a bit of a shame that much of this research is being done in the West, even though the practitioners are in India, but the research on these is being done in the West and the, and the writing of papers and getting credits and filing for you know patents and discoveries and naming things is all, a is, lot of it is being done in the West. It is kind of a shame. It is not that uh, people who are from the practicing side are not allowed to, they are just not doing it, which is, is, a, is a tragic. Now, if you look at the nature of discovery in our tradition, it follows a, 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 it follows a lot of parallels with science. Because when you look at in science, what does science consist of? It is not a set of truths or a set of outcomes, but a set of methods. Science is a set of methods. You follow certain methods and then you get the outcome. So, it is not that this science means E equals MC square, it means this, that, that. Those are the outcomes. But the methodology is that it has to be empirically based. So, it, you should be able to verify it. Yeah, It should be reproducible. So, if somebody has done an experiment, then others should be able to replicate it. It should be independently verifiable. So, people who have no vested interest should be able to verify it and so on. Similar approaches have followed, have, be, have been applied by, uh, have been carried out by ancient rishis in a different kind of empiricism, which is the inner empiricism, which is creating a silence, which is like a clean room laboratory would be, creating a silence and in that silence, silence which is an inner laboratory doing experiments with where do this thought come from, where and you know observing, making inner observations and being able to come up with insights which ordinarily our minds are not able to comprehend or our minds are not able to cognize these kind of insights. So, rishis have had some phenomenal insights without the benefit of ex external instrumentation. So, the West certainly has pioneered and done very well in what we call instrumentations of the external kind. And Indians have done very well in a kind of an internal instrumentation also that could be thought of as an instrumentation, the mind being an instrument which can be developed, can be cleaned and, and, and turned into a, a system of observation. Now, the reason you, we, we are sure that the rishis had something going is because they made, they, they, there are mantras which give you uh, the velocity of light. And there is no instrument known in any of our texts that somebody used. And the velocity of light comes out pretty accurate. 
It is not as accurate as today's instruments will tell you, but pretty accurate. In fact, at a time when people in most of the world did not even think that light had a finite velocity, most people thought that it is infinite velocity, it is instantaneous. So, even the idea that there is a finite velocity and here is a formula how you calculate it and the formula is 98 percent or so accurate is absolutely phenomenal. And then things like you know calculating the value of pi to several places pretty accurately. You go on and, and you find a number of observations which are validated, but these observations came out through a kind of an inner in, intuition in a, in a state of consciousness. Uh, which others repeat, replicated because it is uh, Rishi's replicated what other Rishi's had discovered. So, there is this kind of a peer review equivalent that somebody says that a certain meditation or a certain practice gets you some experience, then others can be taught that. It is not that you have to be a specially chosen prophet from God, none of, none of them were, but it is a human potential that every human has. So, somebody can discover it and, uh, it and others can learn and they can also try it. So, this idea of an empirical approach, although this being an inner empiricism, we call it Adhyatma Vidya and being able to replicate it, being able to demonstrate it with independent uh, people is very similar to some of the qualities of science. Now, one of the misconceptions which has suffered, which Hinduism has suffered is that it is very otherworldly, it is superstitious, it is not practical about this world. But you know if you look at the archaeological evidence, people in ancient India were quite advanced in many technologies. You look at civil engineering, you look at architecture, metallurgy, you look at medicine, farming, water harvesting, ships, on and on, cotton, you know so many things. And you find that the evidence from early centuries, very early centuries is very strong. Up to the British period, British period where the British are remarking that Indians make superior steel. Ancient uh, Indian steel called wood steel was exported to Greece, Roman Empire to make swords and things like that because it is far better than anything they could make. So, I am talking about practical things. This is not just some otherworldly philosophical mystical discovery, but these are very practical things that people were doing very well. The first metal to be distilled was zinc in India, in Rajasthan. It is archaeologically accepted by the world community. In fact, some European society of metallurgists or whatever put a, put a big thing out there in that location that this is the first place where zinc was distilled. Now, the distillation of zinc is a breakthrough because when you melt and uh, when, a, when you heat a metal and it becomes liquid, then it becomes vapor, it evaporates, all the impurities are left behind, it evaporates and then in another place you freeze it back becomes solid again, you get the pure metal 100 percent, all the impurities did not evaporate, so they are left behind. So, when you can make pure metals, then you can make alloys of arbitrary, arbitrary uh, combinations, you see. So, India had the w leading export technology in this sort of thing and if you go to, if you look at the archaeological sites and look at the evidence, the, there was a thriving economy of these, this is, would be like today's modern technology, it would be. It would be a, a big, big breakthrough in material science for that time. And this is also this type of prosperity of the external world and I, I, I want to emphasize that Hindu society was not at the expense of neglecting the external world, which is a very, very big uh, misunderstanding we are told that Hindus need to be saved by others because they do not know how to look after themselves, they are not progressive, they are frozen in time, they are uh, you know they, they, they do not have the idea of progress, of rationality, but how did they do all these things I am talking about, you see. You also notice economic prosperity. The uh, European historians of the history of, uh, history of economics, including now the latest encyclopedias on the history of world economics will tell you 
that till the 1850s, India and China had about two thirds of the world GDP. India had like 25 percent, China had 30 percent, something like that. And what is now called the West was less than 20 percent, including Europe, US and so on. And this only it took about 100 years, I think from uh, 1750s to 1850 that is when the decline came and there was an industrial revolution in England, a whole lot of transfer. India from being a export country became an importing country, England from becoming being an import oriented country became an export oriented company. That 90 year, 100 year period is when things shifted. But until that for thousands of years India had, India and China were very advanced in, in econo economy. And this is, uh, test, uh, this is written and uh, documented by lots of faders and lots of ancient historians. And the reason I often when I give talks in schools in this country I often say well where does India fit in American history. And I am surprised that hardly any history teacher all these uh, once I was made uh, chair of the uh, Asian studies in the state of New York by the governor. And so he had a uh, his sister, that particular governor, his sister was a teacher, educator. So she brought all these leading educators to a discussion on this. And I said, I first want to ask you, when you are teaching, why do you want to teach India and how would you teach India in the context of American history? Not one of them started by saying, you know, that is what Columbus was looking for. Not one of them thought of that. It was not positioned that way in their head. So then I had to tell them, that the queen of Spain was like a venture capitalist looking for a big intellectual property breakthrough which would be worth a lot and that was a sea route to India. And, the re and because the sea route would bypass the land hassles of the land route and the reason the land route was a hassle is because the Ottoman Empire which was Muslim uh, has the Ottoman Empire controlled Central Asia. Eastern Europe. So, the land route which was traditionally called the Silk Route from China and India on one side and Europe on the other side blocked by the Ottoman Empire. So, either they would not let things through or they would charge 20 times the price. They would, deti they would decide as a strategic advantage they had access to the Indian and Chinese goods, Europeans did not. It was a, it was a huge problem beca because Europe needed these things. And there was no sea route at that time. There was no Suez Canal. There was no uh, around Africa. None of that. So uh, the Columbus journey was a venture capital journey to find a sea route to India, and that is how this whole thing started. So you see, if you look at, uh, and then Vasco da Gama took the route around Africa. One of them wanted to, to take the uh, route across the Pacific, across the Atlantic and the other one around Africa. So, going east and west respectively hoping to find, find India and did not know that American continent is in the middle and the rest we all, we all know what happened. So, you see India is a, has been a very important part of world history as a positive economy, as a source of knowledge, as a source of technology, as a source of all kinds of things. The Middle East had huge amount of Indian workers. Today they are uh, workers of different uh, different level, but you know you will see university professors, mathematicians, astronomers, medicine people, doctors, all kinds of people in the medieval era in the Middle Eastern countries coming from India, being acknowledged as such. And a lot of the Indian knowledge trans translated into Arabic and Persian became part of the uh, Middle East knowledge system. And then centuries later would be translated into European languages like trigonometry, geometry, algebra, a lot of these things which Europeans feel they got from the Arabs and therefore they misclassify it as Arab numerals and so on. Okay. What they do not know is that the Arabs themselves got it from, from India which the Arabs acknowledged. Al Jabr was an author whose book starts off by saying that this is being translated from Malayali. And that book by Al Jabr, when it later gets translated into Latin and so on, that knowledge becomes known as algebra. So, this uh, India, India is a source of knowledge for the West, for the Middle East, and all over Asia. 
I mean the, 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 the people who never try to hide Indian contributions, you will find them in China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia today. It is very interesting uh, when my foundation used to do these world conferences, once we got a delegation of, I think uh, 15 years ago, we got a delegation from China on uh, uh, Vedanta philosophy, Hindu philosophy, uh, you know ancient mathematics, Vedic science, all these kind of things. There were like quite a lot of them and I thought that uh, maybe they, were, they must be dissidents or they must be people that have run away from China and uh, maybe these things are not allowed. So I, I, I spent a lot of time getting to know them and they told me it is just the opposite. They are, the Chinese government is encouraging all this because they think it is part of their history and they want to bring in all this knowledge from all the sources and there is a large amount of study of Indology in China which is very respectful of the Indian sources, not, not the, like some of the Indology in this country. So the, uh, in Southeast Asia, you go, you go to Southeast Asia, you will find a huge respect for Hindu and Buddhist uh, origins of so much knowledge. And you know, we, we think of Buddhists having taken Buddhism to all over Asia, East Asia. But when the monks were going, they were taking uh, samples of food and agriculture, they were taking music, uh, they were taking linguistics, they were taking mathematics, astronomy. It was a huge amount of knowledge export. So places like Nalanda, which is a Buddhist university, would be like today's, you know, Duke University, Harvard University, Princeton University, they were like Ivy Leagues. And if you look at the history of Nalanda, it is written by foreign students. There are volumes written by students in Mongolia, students in Cambodia who had gone and, and, and students in China who had gone there and studied and brought back, you know, great accounts of what the curriculum is and what is being taught. So from that you can reconstruct what was going on in Nalanda. It was attracting the cream of the brightest students from these countries. And uh, the Queen of Cambodia, Cambodia was quite a regional power at one time. The Queen of Cambodia had endowed a whole college, built a college within Nalanda University for the sole purpose so her brightest students could be sent, live there, bring the knowledge back. So like today, people from around the world would go to some Ivy League in the US and bring the knowledge back to India. That used, used to be the way it was in India, where people from other countries used to come. So you have to understand that there is this inner journey, Adhyatma Vidya, mystical, uh, trying to do some knowledge, gathering uh, inside, uh, using these meditation techniques and other techniques, you know. And you, and you cannot say that this is otherworldly, mystical, world negating. These are unfortunate labels that have been given to Hinduism and we have accepted them. Uh, when, whenever I am told that Hindus are mystical, they are otherworldly, they are world negating, I tell him that look, chances are one in ten doctors in your town may be an Indian. Now, he is not world negating. You do not want a world negating guy doing surgery on you. Uh, people who are in Google, people who are in NASA, they are not some world negating bunch of guys. So then the answer is, yeah, but you know, they learned all this from the West. It was not like that. You know, this, and, and this is so, so sad. Our people have coloni are colonized. So Narayan Murthy, when asked once, why Indian so smart and, and he said, oh, British, we are very grateful British came and taught us math and English. And so, you know, we do not even know our own history. So, it is so, so, so ridiculous, you know. So, the history of science is not well known, uh, of Indian science. And this is why my foundation started a 20 volume project many years ago. We finished nine volumes on the history of Indian science and technology. And we focused on hard evidence based technologies like steel, zinc, copper production, metallurgy, cities, you know, making construction material, water highways, these sort of things, shipping and so on. And so uh, to, to remove this, to fight, to combat this stigma that one of the things wrong with this Hindu tradition is that it leads to social uh, deprivation and you, you do not care about healing people and you know you are worrying about because they come up with, uh, they come up with some kind of a Hindu argument to show that it is a useless thing, uh, that you are trapped in some cycle of karmic fatalism and that is why you abuse your women, that is why there is poor people, we have to send some missionaries to rescue you and so if, you, if people become Hindus then they are going to be uh, abusive. Uh, this, this, this sort of a very negative, uh, almost like an anti-social. Uh, 
portrayal is been frozen about us. Whereas if you look at all the facts of the, 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 the science and technology contributions are not deniable and they are not, uh, uh, you cannot uh, argue against physical evidence. So we, we decided that the first 20 volumes will be only based on physical evidence, not text evidence. So a text may say somebody had a spacecraft, but we do not believe it because I have not seen one. I have not seen one. It says there was some uh, weapon of mass destruction. So it must be a nuke, but I have not seen a crater with radioactivity. So I do not believe that. I am a hard scientist. I do not believe in all that unless I can see evidence today. But I can see a steel pillar. I can, we can do research on it and find out that there is a layer of phosphorus which is exceedingly uh, few microns and that prevented it from rusting for a very long time. We can see uh, evidences of all sorts of technological things which we can bring into a laboratory and we can evaluate them. So if we can construct the history of science and technology starting with only physically verifiable evidence that meets the criteria of rigor. So based on that we can, uh, we are constructing, it will take a very long time. Uh, to uh, an accurate picture of Indian of Hindu contribution. These are, these people were Hindus. Another interesting thing that you find out is that this is not Brahmin related, nothing to do with the elite text kind of people. Uh, the example I gave you of uh, zinc distillation, those would be people by today's standard considered low caste. They were the, they were the ones doing all this. A lot of, so, so you see what, which jati or you know how they moved up or down also had to do with the economy of a particular trade which may go up at some point in time and go down at some point in time and it is not like frozen in, in some kind of a historical canon or religious canon that was not the case. So the a, a completely uh, one has to just start at scratch uh, trying to understand our history, the history of Hinduism is a, is a highly uh, misrepresented uh, history at this point in time. So if you look at uh, uh, what the uh, uh, modern, uh, modern society has benefited, you will find things like linguistics. Uh, until the 1800s, uh, it was a requirement in Europe, every European university had a major department of Sanskrit, when, uh, starting in the year 1800 in Germany, France, England, they were all starting departments of Sanskrit. And to get a doctorate in linguistics, you had to study Panini. You had to study Sanskrit and Panini. That was sort of the gold standard of knowing grammar. And then you could study in other, you can, ask, you can look at the history of linguistics. You can ask people the history of linguistics and the uh, 19th century role of uh, ling what was the relationship between linguists and Sanskrit. You will see that there. And it was, it took a hundred years of digesting Panini into a kind of a meta linguistics, meta grammar where the Sanskrit could be kind of forgotten. But now it is revived again because of computational linguistics. Uh, to translate natural languages, you know if you want to speak in language X and have it translated immediately into Y automated, automated which will become a killer app, you know, all it will become a, one of those apps where every telecom network will have it. Every uh, one of these smartphones and tablets, everyone will have, you can enter any language, get any language out, it is getting there. The cutting edge of that, that field is called computational linguistics and the cutting edge of that is Panini's grammar as the engine. So you go from language X using Panini's grammar, you, you reformulate it into, you represent it that way and then you output it in language Y. And the sad thing is that why, not only there are two things, not only is the credit to Parani's language being faded and er, erased, it is being called computational linguistics and the Sanskrit is being turned into a different code, that is the alphabet. But worse than that, whatever does not fit certain pronunciations, certain ways, certain things you uh, extenuate, certain things you emphasize in the way you pronounce which are extremely important to, to the mantric effect in our tradition are being removed, are being erased because current uh, today people do not understand the value. So whatever they, can, whatever they use, they are taking it and calling it something else with a new terminology and whatever they cannot find useful is being erased and forgotten. And I call that digestion like you know prey uh, is eaten, 
and what is useful is becomes part of the predator's body and whatever is not useful is rejected and thrown and the prey disappears. So that is how Sanskrit uh, first it got digested into linguistics, European linguistics, Western linguistics and now there is another revival of the study of Sanskrit from the point of by, by computer science people uh, from the point of view of computational linguistics. So in 10 or 20 years you may not need Sanskrit at all because whatever was considered useful is now computa in computational linguistics and you do not need to know Sanskrit, Pandits are out, all this kind of stuff is gone. This that that is what we are headed for. So the uh, influences of Hindu knowledge and thought on the rest of the world are because it goes they go through this digestion. Therefore, we forget where these things came from because these are mapped and because they are decontextualized from the Hindu source and recontextualized as Judaic Christianity, Western enlightenment, Western science, some new kind of a jargon, new kind of terminology. Uh, because that happens therefore uh, future generations do not even know where it came from. So uh, a friend of mine, an Indian doctor 10 years ago comes back very excited from one of these uh, medical things where they have uh, learnt uh, mindfulness meditation to cure some things in his field and I told him this is Vipassana and he was very angry because he, he, he you mean what his grandfather was teaching, you mean he has come to United States, has gone to Harvard, gotten a degree and went all the way somewhere and paid a lot of money and learned the mindfulness, got certified and now he is uh, uh, certified to cure people using a certain thing and this Raji Moroza tell him the same thing that uh, some regular stuff that his grandfather used to do is very insulted, very insulted. And I had to argue with this guy that this is mindfulness meditation, John Cabot Zen learnt it from uh, Goenka uh, and in his early days used to credit him and learnt it from other people also, many sources and then he started the Mindfulness Institute, then he started gradually, gradually the acknowledgement became a footnote, then it became an end note, then it disappeared, then he started saying he has gone ahead of it and so on. I gave many examples of this. So the history of the Indian origin of an idea gets erased and when it is discovered and by the westerner reformulated that person is named the pioneer, the discoverer and the history begins with him. And that is why you are told that America was discovered in 1492. So when I went to this, when I go to this museum in New York, the Natural History Museum and then we, they used to, I used to go with my, the school where my kids went and they used to always say this is in America, you know, discover it. So I used to say you think the people who lived in America for 10,000 years had not discovered it. But then you know there is a, there is a uh, there is a history of this idea of discovery. There is a doctrine of Christian discovery. You should search, just search doctrine of Christian discovery, and you will find that in the uh, 1500s, uh, 1400s and 1500s, uh, the Vatican was asked, "Who owns all these lands that we are discovering?" That we, and we call we say we have discovered on behalf of the Church because church claimed uh, to be owned the God's property, church was God's franchise. So God had created the franchise, so the whole everything belongs and so they are going around claiming this franchise. And so when a person discovered they would discover it on behalf of the church and so the question was you know who owns it and what not. So there were a lot of papal bulls, a lot of popes, papal bull was like a decree like you would say fatwa it was Vatican fatwas, papal bull, that is what they were, absolute decrees. And in these decrees it uh, clarified that uh, discovery when a Christian uh, sent by the Christian church uh, stakes claim, it belongs, that is called, that is a moment of discovery. In other words discovery happens when we find something, yeah, until then it is not really discovery. So that is the doctrine of Christian discovery. And uh, some federal cases were fought in the United States with Native Americans claiming that look this belongs to us 
and this doctrine of Christian discovery was used in these arguments, cited. You search doctrine of Christian discovery, you will find thousands of pages of case history in the United States also on uh, citing this sort of a, uh, proof of discovery because of this papal bull that said that discovery is when Christians discover it. So now in the enlightenment era, Christian discovery is replaced by, you know, when your patent lawyer files the case, files a patent, it's called discovery. So this notion of ownership and who, who has discovered it is uh, now this neuroscience is sort of the discovery of mindfulness, mindfulness meditation and, and uh, all the other traditional things that go with it. So I, I think that if you want to really understand Hindu contributions, you have to claim, reclaim some of these things back. You cannot on a, you cannot, uh, uh, it's not a level playing field, it's not an honest and fair discussion. If credit has been taken, stolen you might say, and mischaracterized in terms of how the discoveries have happened, and you cannot take that as the set of facts and then try to see how Hinduism stacks up or what its worth is and where its values are going forward. So now, uh, uh, and, and I could go on, you know, there's this, uh, the worst part is that these things have gone, become fashionable in India also. Um, every time I go there, they have this like Howard Gardner teaching, you know, uh, multiple intelligences. So Tata's, all these guys are listening and Infosys corporate headquarters call this Harvard guru to teach about multiple intelligences, which basically says there are many kinds of intelligences inside, inside a person. It's not just a linear scale, there are many kinds of intelligences. But as I point out, Sri Aurobindo wrote very extensively on planes and parts of being, that the being has many planes and many parts in these planes. And his theory of education was that you have to educate all the planes and parts of being. So you don't have a, it's not one, the child or a grown up is not just sort of one kind of intelligence, there's many, many planes and parts of this. And when you're educating, you have to educate all these. Whole theory of education uh, that Sri Aurobindo wanted came from that, that mode. Uh, some of the people in the West were inspired in India, like uh, uh, Maria Montessori during the World War, lived in India, met Sri Aurobindo, met a lot of these people, and she developed some of these ideas. She came them, brought them here. And then uh, the Waldorf schools started by uh, Rudolf Steiner. He was a theosophist. He'd gone there, brought these sort of ideas. Uh, there is something called accelerated learning. If you look up accelerated learning, they teach languages fast, they teach mathematics fast, they teach things very fast. And you look up uh, many schools, many places are teaching accelerated learning, your kids can go there and learn something fast. And if you look at the history of the pioneers in the West, they uh, credit a man called Lozanov. Lozanov, must, he must be in his 90s if he's alive, uh, for being the granddaddy of a new system of He's a neuroscientist, a new, new system of learning which, where you can learn faster. And that's, the, that's where the history starts, as if he came up with everything. But then you look at Lozanov's own book, his first book, is his experiences in India, where he was sent during the Soviet era, the, during the Cold War era, he was sent to see if yogis have extraordinary powers because they, what we call Siddhis. CIA was also doing this kind of research. CIA thought that maybe we learn how to, uh, how to have distance vision, we can look at the spy, the spy, satellite, spy missiles or missiles of the other side or maybe yogis can do some things which have defense applications and so on. So CIA was doing some experiments and so were the Soviets. So the Soviets sent these kind of people like Lozanov who would go and become like an anthropologist or become some kind of a wandering guy going around, you know, picking up information. And he came back and he said that there is one extraordinary thing he learned that yogis have, that, that they have huge memories. They can recite 10,000 verses. They, some of them know even 100,000. They have huge memories 
And as a neuroscientist, he couldn't figure out how it's possible to have so much memory. And so he wanted to go back and understand how they can memorize such an enormous amount of stuff and keep it in their heads. And he came up with this uh, thesis that one of, their, one of the reasons they are able to memorize is because they have a certain rhythm, intonation to their chant. In their, it's like when you were kids, if you go to village schools in India, maybe they've stopped doing it. They sing the tables. And they say two times three is six, two times four is eight. They're singing with a certain rhythm. They're singing like it's, it's a song. Now, I was in one of these western, westernized schools and we didn't know what the, why they're doing all this. So, I would go to this village school of my grandparents and I would say, what are they learning? This, you know, and they'd say, well, these are traditions, this is how we learn. Now, this Lozanov says that uh, when you have this musical quality in knowledge, you are, you are encoding it in the left brain and the right brain simultaneously. Because the musical quality goes in the right brain, that was his model, and the analytical knowledge itself goes in the left brain. And since you have a dual brain experience, a dual brain learning, there is some kind of a correlation, some kind of a mapping in both brains and so recall is easier. That was his theory. So he said that we should introduce multimedia and that Indians learn a lot through theater, touching. They are experiential in knowledge. They are not sitting and getting knowledge uh, cerebrally. Uh, they are doing it through their senses. They'll dance and get an idea. They'll dance an idea, and that idea becomes part of them. So he was very impressed by this kind of gurukul system of knowledge. So he came and he started, and this became part of accelerated learning. So in University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, where we have a center for Indic studies, and I'm involved in that, we started a project to bring this Vedic learning system back to the United States, and call it Vedic system. So we have a project called SALT, Super Accelerated Learning Technique. And there we show this is a Vedic system. There is one Pandit from uh, Trinidad or Guyana, he from, one, from the Caribbean countries, who is, uh, he is a robotics engineer also. So he is introducing this learning system into the schools. And he is able to show that uh, he can take random kids, including dropouts, not people at a very high percentile, just average people. And they, the 12 years required to go through the Massachusetts school system, he can do it in 7 years with ordinary people. So this means it's a breakthrough in learning because a lot of, uh, this way you can learn faster. So I'm giving you an idea of a Hindu system, you can bring it back. And so, so we need to bring such things back into India also because India also lost its education system and started producing British clerks for the British uh, I, uh, administrative service. Yeah? So, uh, th this system of learning in the villages, in the traditional areas going and replaced by what is considered to be educated people. Yeah? So also oral, oral tradition is gone, going fast. Because unless you are able to read, write in the modern western sense, you are not educated. So the criteria of who is educated has to do with literacy today. And you may be otherwise, an uh, oral person may be very educated. So a traditional uh, uh, sitar player, a tabla player, or a kathak dancer does not need to have liter written. He needs to internalize the knowledge on his body. He has to have a huge, profound amount of knowledge in his body, a singer. But these would be classified, these traditional uh, professions would be classified as illiterate people, uneducated people, you see. So we are also doing a lot of harm and violence of our own because we've taken in a whole epistemology of a colonized mindset. Now I can just go on, but you know I I want to uh, I want to uh, one or two examples more and then I'll stop. One of the things we just discovered is that in uh, this is a very interesting one for scientists. You know we were told that nanotechnology is more like more of mostly physics because you are making nanoparticles you know, atom or molecule at a time, kind of a physics process. <clears throat> but some people started looking at Ayurvedic concoctions, which are called bhasma. Bhasma is a kind of a chemical process, some herbal plants and you process in a certain way and that's the bhasma and then that becomes a treatment 
medicine for something. So people are looking at how, how it's possible that uh, basma made of gold or containing gold as one of the ingredients uh, has an effect which is beneficial, antioxidant and stuff like that. Uh, we, we don't think that gold is something that you ought to have. Even uh, certain uh, metals, heavy metals which would be considered toxic, but as basma, they are having beneficial effect. So what they are finding is that the basma produces nanoparticles. They are so small that at that size, the uh, absorption behavior is very different than when the material is in a larger particles. So there is a huge uh, nanochemistry going on. Uh, there are papers on Basma uh, that uh, US government has funded, lot of research in the US has funded to see uh, can, do, can some of these processes produce nano, nanochemistry which has usefulness today and some of these things are, are, are of use. So it is not only for correcting the history of our tradition, it is not only for setting the record straight and, and, uh, and getting rid of you know all these taboos and misconceptions. It is also for the interest of humanity's future being able to take these ideas forward that uh, we ought to do this kind of research. So I uh, would like to just sort of stop and uh, uh, take questions and continue the conversation in an interactive way. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Dalji Ji, for such an insightful talk. I really enjoyed it. I have a very burning question in my mind. I hear this word uh, Hindutva quite often in Indian context, especially in terms of Indian politics. Where I, I see that it's one of the most abused words in Indian politics right now, which was coined by V. D. Savarkar a few years, I mean, some years back. So I was wondering that what do you think is meant by Hindutva and how is it relevant in context of India right now? See, I, I do not use it, but I, and I understand how others use it. For me, the word Hindu is fine. Uh, Hindu tattva, tattva is essence. So you could say Hinduness. So Hinduness is Hindutva, as it literally means. As far as I am concerned, Hindu is fine for me. Being a Hindu is fine for me. Uh, once a word is coined, then it tends to be associated it with uh, in a positive way or negative way with whoever coined it, whoever uses it. So then it be is considered like his ideology, his ism, he started one. And especially if uh, the word Hindu is already there, but a new one is new word is coined, variation of it is coined. And then it also can be seen as is this for a particular political group. So does it mean I have to vote in for that group in order to be a good Hindu now? It is like if you were to say singerness for singing okay, and you form this group called singerness group. Now I do not join your group does it mean I cannot sing? You see, see a, 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 a word can be an adjective which describes like good Hindu. Hinduness. Suppose you take a word, an adjective like good. So I make a company called Good, and I have many products from uh, like Walmart. I, I have all the products. It's called Good. So then, whenever somebody says your product is bad, I'll say no, it's good. So the confusion is good as a proper noun or good as an adjective. Correct. I am entitled to using word good for my company, right. While I am entitled to saying this is good product because it is in the proper noun sense, I am giving the impression that it is a good product in the adjective sense, correct. So same way I can brand Hindutva and we can be a bunch of non-Hindus who but we will say no we have got this brand we are Hindutva. The, the idea is does the meaning of the word, does the organization live up to the meaning of the word 
or is it that by owning the word you assume that you already are Hindu? You are, you are the standard of Hinduness because you've got that meaning. It's like I got the word, I trademarked the word good, good products. So I'm the one who got the good products. You, how can you have good products? I, I have that. You see. So to me, the issue is that uh, I would, I am very clear on this. I am all spending my whole life, everything I got for dharma. To me, it's not the property of a particular party or a particular individual. I want good Hindus in every party. I don't mind if leftist Hindu, rightist Hindu is a good Hindu is a good Hindu. I, I would like to have good dharmic people all over society, everywhere. And so if a particular organization calls itself something else, but they're good Hindus, I will be happy. If they are calling themselves Hindutva and they're good Hindus, I'm very happy. But if either of them is not good Hindu, I'm not supporting them. So the name is not my criteria. So I, I, I feel that uh, there's nothing wrong if somebody has a name good products. But I would recommend to you that you have to go beneath the name and check it out. Don't let the name automatically mean that the products must be good because they call it that way. You see? So uh, that's how I feel about this. But you know, it's a name in circulation. Uh, but I think that lately uh, people are happy saying Hindu. I've seen that like for instance right now in the political election people are saying Hindu. Quite fine and there's nothing, no reason not to. Sir Janathan, I'm from India obviously. Uh, I don't know uh, what other background. No, I, uh, whatever you want. Are you in this university? Uh, I am a veterinary pathologist. Uh, okay. I okay. work uh, as good. a scientist. Okay, good. good. Yeah. In your opinion, what each of us can do to prevent uh, what you mentioned, we being erased from history and history starting at a new point. So what each of us can do? This is a very, this is the concern 24 seven I worry about, you know, the biggest threat is not so much attack, but being digested. And people have not understood this digestion. That is why these books I have are trying to explain it, you know, over and over again. So when you are being digested, see, the predator is uh, praising you. He's saying, you're so delicious. Smells good. This is good dinner. That's what the predator is saying. He's not uh, criticizing. Nobody, uh, nobody is angry and upset at the food he's going to eat. You obviously wouldn't eat it unless you found it nice. So the fact that you're being praised, it, you, you, it doesn't mean that it's good for you because it could also be the capacity of we want to appropriate you, digest you, finish you off. So that's a very, it looks like a very positive thing happening. When people are, praise, people are taking Hindu ideas and replacing the Hindu with some Christian yoga or uh, some neuroscience idea or some, you know, computational linguistics or whatever, all these things are going on. So many, I'm writing a lot on how Hinduism is being digested into things where the Hinduism is being erased and then what is left behind we are told is no good, Hinduism is no good, whatever was good has been taken away and digested. Our people have not understood it. Our people are very happy promoting somebody who comes and praises them and they do not understand that this is, this is not in the capacity of helping us as Hindus but basically taking, extracting things out of it, you see. So, this is like a discussion I was having earlier today also. A lot of people are, we are supporting, our communities are supporting, seem nice on the surface. They are diplomatic, they are polite. They will say the right things, they will say praise you and you are so starved for compliments that you are willing to do anything just because they praised you. So this digestion is a very uh, dangerous thing that is happening. Now, my antidote to digestion, I have explained in this book called Indra's Net. In being different, I have explained the danger of digestion and in Indra's Net, I have explained a concept called poison pill and a concept called uh, uh, 
porcupine defense, uh, which is to create to look for something non digestible which is inside that entity. So, there is something something inside this entity that will protect us that will protect this whole entity because that one part of it they do not they cannot accept they cannot digest they can, it can destroy them. So, because one part of it can destroy them and this part is not removable uh, this gives them a headache and I have explained it in a few examples how uh, the, the critical part a necessary part for something to get digested is they remove certain parts of it, they change, they, they compromise certain parts of it, they remove this, they remove that, then they can digest it. So, for example, somebody called uh, Stephen Batchelor in England, one of the most uh, pro Buddhism scholars for most of his life, uh, very well known, very highly regarded, uh, has started now uh, removing things from Buddhism which will not fit the western paradigm, reincarnation karma he says we not part of Buddhism ok. Because as long as these are part of Buddhism they serve as a poison pill since you can you cannot Christianize you cannot Christianize a system which has got these in it because it 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 is contraindicated for Christianity. So, he has to remove these in order to make it Christian compliant. You see what I am saying? So, this is an example. Now, he was giving a talk in, in India International Center in Delhi a couple of years ago, room full of in, uh, people there, in, uh, in, you know, everybody is such, so excited that this man, he knows Buddhism and he's everybody thinking he's like another, you know, big shot, big teacher of ours. And nobody had picked up that his, his Buddhism had this subtle shift, subtle shift which you will not even catch unless you ask him and you will not even think of asking him unless you have read his books because in front of you he is not going to say these things. So, I have studied it, I have understood what he has done, how he is digesting. So, I was the only person in the audience who said why have you excluded karma and, Buddha and reincarnation from Buddhism and he did not want to say that this is how I will make it part of Christianity, of course he did not want to say that. So, he tried to give me this argument that this was later added by Brahmins, but Buddha never said it, this is what he tried to say. So, I, I knew this answer. So, I gave him all the evidence showing that Buddha right from his original teaching, Buddha in fact described his own early lives, Buddha, Buddha described his own early lives. So, sorry. So, the uh, burden is on us to be sufficiently knowledgeable to argue. Now, this put him on the defensive and I even told him I said uh, that uh, could it be that this is not some kind of a discovery, the motive is not some kind of a discovery of the real history and all that, but the motive is that you want to make it Christian compliant yeah, and you want to make it western science compliant because as long as certain Buddhist philosophies require reincarnation and karma as part of the cosmology, part of the nature of being. yeah. Uh, as long as that is the case, you are having difficulty appropriating it. To appropriate it, you got to get rid of something which is a problem for you. So, this, so you see every thing we have, we have to look deep and deep and find some ingredients which the other side wants to get rid of, which we should not allow them to get rid of because the, the it will to most Hindus I come across it is a it, they think it is a useless fight I am having why bother it is so much little detail, but this is so important because when you get rid of that thing it is not just a technical issue. Now, it is digestible and it is no longer Hindu nothing to do with Hindu it is a, a common thing it is a very common thing you follow what I am saying. So, I am making a one of the uh, one of the books I am writing is on uh, what is non digestibly Hindu. So, if you want to protect against digestion and if you knew these are the 10 things that are so non digestible, you sub se pale you got to teach these things, you got to build a foundation on these things. Every guru whatever his philosophy, whatever his teaching must introduce these 10 as ingredients that you cannot leave out. That Hindu cannot get digested because he is rooted in something, he is anchored in those solid things. 
but general be good guy avoid bad things and go pay your taxes rotate your tires run your antivirus these kind of normal goody goody things everybody can do what's this everybody can do these things so hinduism become watered down you know generic goody goody stuff that's that is the problem uh, and the reason we our gurus have done that is partly they do not understand this battle this kurukshetra where we are being digested they don't have enough knowledge of the other side to be able to argue they are compromised because they are looking for funding and patronage and support from the very people who, who are digesting i went to this immensely great guru i went for one month uh, deep tantra meditation where they teach they put you into a state of death near death you you go through what is called death meditation you actually simulate dying different parts of the body and you are conscious the you conscious but you are your body you stop breathing even it's a huge experience and when you come out of it and this goes on you you first do it for one minute then you longer longer when you've done this one month uh, course you're so completely different now some of the most enthusiastic uh, participants were westerners and this guru told me that my best students they got their recorders and they got this they got that but what he didn't know is all the conversation during the lunch time was i'm going to teach this course i'm going to make it part of my workshop i'm going to write that book i'm going to invent this term i've i've come up with this new thing i've got this new lab i'm going to invent you know so they are they already got their commercial minds working okay so this uh, this kind of uh, uh, corporatization uh, uh, commercialization commodification you know of uh, of hinduism Uh, has been facilitated by our gurus because they 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 get more money from these people they get uh, they, they are good followers because they have a certain agenda they have certain motive they actually they are there that is a research lab so the thousands and thousands of years of r and d that the rishis did the gurus are happy to package it and sell it and so uh, the as a political fight we can't win the hindu american foundation is trying it like that uh, they were young guys who used to attend my seminars these hindu american foundation in the 90s me and megani these guys and they learned these issues and started an organization but they did not go deep enough into the philosophy so they turned it into a political fight as a political fight how can you uh, stop somebody from practicing yoga how can you you can't how can you stop them from practicing mindfulness meditation or any of these things you can't do that so rather than a political fight you have to fight on authenticity you have to say that if you remove a certain ingredient to make it christian compliant then actually you've done a distortion it is nothing to do with politics it's not that you can't do it but you have to do it correctly so that's the uh, it it's a little more demanding it's intellectually more demanding but the only way to survive is that we have to discover the uh, digestion going on we have to come up with resistance to the digestion we have to discover the u turns going on we have to reclaim all that knowledge back as ours and uh, create a new generation of leaders who can stand up and argue uh, the first question is we often uh, hearing the debates these days in india and about the uh, and as as someone has already pointed out the hindutva so there is a they are of, often referring us a judgment of supreme court of india that hindu hindutva is a, is a, is a, is a jeevan paddhati not a religion or something like that so i would like to understand what exactly do what exactly we mean by hindu if i am saying i am a proudly hindu i the moment i say i am a proud hindu i am having a tag of communal being a communal or something like that so that's the first question the second question is uh, when we discuss hinduism with with other religion friends of other religions they the first question they ask me about the caste system and it's 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 almost impossible to justify those that how the how you can justify the caste system i agree on that that in an ancient days we were having the caste based on the birth not by i'm uh, no, sorry based on the profession not by the birth but i would like to understand it from you okay so both these questions are very good uh, first is uh, is hinduism a way of life i have uh, i have made fun of this hinduism equals way of life in this indra's net there is actually a section called is hinduism way of life so you just read that but basically i've said that a way of life it doesn't tell you anything because uh, you know dogs have a dog way of life and cats have a cat way of life 
and Bin Laden had a Bin Laden way of life, Ravan had a Ravan way of life. There is no life which doesn't have a way of life. I mean, you can't say that there is life which has no way of life. Every life has some way of life, you know. So to say it, uh, Hinduism is a way of life, unless you tell me what specific way of life, it doesn't define anything. It is as vague as saying that a car is a collection of molecules. Well, obviously it's a collection of molecules, but so is a banana and so is a chair. So it doesn't tell you what's distinct about a car, what kind of collection of molecules makes it a car as opposed to a bicycle, you know. So what way of life it makes it Hindu? So anytime somebody says Hinduism is a way of life, you tell him, okay, the, then the next question is what, what kind of way of life makes it a Hindu as opposed to non-Hindu? So he hasn't really answered anything by saying it's a way of life. He's just, uh, uh, the question continues, unanswered, right? So it's a really useless answer because it doesn't do anything, right? So I'm trying in here defining, I've defined the word astika in this book, astika. Not uh, somebody who believes in Vedas, but a much broader definition. And I've defined what I call open architecture. I've defined the term open architecture in this book, Indra's Net. So I'm, I'm introducing a new vocabulary to bring in Hinduism the, as an open architecture where a lot of things fit. But open architecture also needs to be protected. Open architecture doesn't mean that anything goes. Viruses are not allowed in the internet. You have to get rid of with virus scan and all that, right? So similarly, this open architecture has to protect itself from things which are dangerous, which are trying to undermine the openness. Otherwise, it won't remain open. So I have given this whole de definition description in a, in a very careful way to give maximum flexibility for many different kinds of people to be Hindus in many different ways and yet exclude clearly those who are hostile to it. This is a very detailed definition I am doing. I am probably going to do some workshops also on this. The second question is on uh, caste system. Now, you know, what you can, what you, I mean, believe, I feel that caste as it has become today, uh, which is, you know, birth based and exclusive and all that is a bad idea. It is not a useful idea, but I do not uh, link it as a problem from the Hindu scriptures or Hindu texts or Hindu system because we don't have that word at all. There is no word caste in Sanskrit. It's not, it's a Portuguese word called casta. Portuguese came and they came up with this word. We have a word jati, which means community. And we have a word varna, which means your aptitude, your personal disposition, your, what your talents are. So this idea that there are different varnas, different kinds of aptitudes and different kinds of skills that people do is a beautiful idea. But it has nothing to do with your birth. You see, uh, in the West, one of the things that uh, Westerners are very proud of is separation of church and state. They, they wouldn't say it's a bad thing. Uh, church corresponds to Brahmin and state corresponds to Kshatriya because Kshatriya is the head of the state and Brahmin is the equivalent, not, we don't have church concept. But separation of Kshatriya and Brahmin is a very old concept that Kshatriya will not become Brahmin, Brahmin will not become Kshatriya. The one who rules, who has power, is not the one who's got the authority of the Brahmin for rituals and for those certain kinds of functions, because combining them would give too much power. Our separation of uh, these forms of capital goes even further, because neither of these two could hold uh, economic assets. So Vaishya, who is who's like the corporate guy, Wall Street, people with wealth are, are neither political uh, power nor intellectual power. So what you can say is that the intellectual property, R&D, knowledge, you know, teaching, uh, knowledge workers, that should not mix with political power because it will be abusive and neither of those two should become corporatized and into money making. So these three camps are three different forms of capital. They should stay separate. I think it's a it's a it's an economic principle which is very meritorious. Now, the problem comes when you take these forms of capital and you start de determining based on inheritance. That's the problem. Now, in this country, wealth is inherited. So Vashya is a uh, uh, by birth. Because Bill Gates' kid will be different than your and my kids. Uh, you know, 
large part of the wealth is self-made, but large part of the wealth is also inherited. The inheritance laws allow that. Political power is not. Political power, although Al Gore is multi-generational, Kennedy's are multi-generational, Bushes are multi-generational politicians, you can have examples, but it is not institutionally restricted that way. Uh, it, it is uh, easier for people to uh, take up their parents' position because they have network contacts and all that stuff, right? Similarly, intellectual also, you'll find a lot of people are, you know, many generations of professor and so on somewhere. So, the, the, uh, by birth, a continuity of the profession of the family by birth also happens here, but it is not as much as in the case of uh, India. So, the problem is also mobility. You see, if you have, if you don't have public schools, then you are going to learn what your father teach, studies. Your, your father is a tabla player, you learn from the age of two to help him out and you learn the beats and your, or your father is a, you know, tailor, then you learn how tailoring is done because there is no public school where you are going to learn these things. In the same village, if there is a public school and the kids are going to a public school, then you know, then they will move into whatever their aptitude is. It is as simple as that. You do not have to have quota in the jobs, you have to have, you have to have mandatory education. This quota in the jobs is a quick fix of a lack of universal education. If you give everybody universal education, K through 12 like in this country, required by law, everybody will get. And not just a symbolic education, but mandatory quality, real genuinely educated people. Then, then the, uh, the marketplace will pick the best, uh, who would not hire the best worker? I do not think corporate India worries about caste when they are hiring people. I do not think corporate India worries. So, if you want to look at mobility, mobility comes from, first of all, have free competition, intensely competitive business climate, where they have to compete on merit, therefore they must get the best talent from wherever they can get. Yeah. And they cannot uh, hire, hire that uh, this guy's father worked here, will hire him. They can't because then they will not be competitive. And then second, we give everybody education through the end of high school. So give everybody the talent that they are capable of. Yeah. So if people are producing, people are coming from all the different village, village families into a school, public school system, a good quality school system, and then the graduates of that are hired based on their merit, then there is no caste left. In one generation, you can finish it off. You do not need to politicize it. You do not need to have vote banks based on it because then you are making a permanent problem out of it. And you are fragmenting the politics by creating vote bank politics and you are setting the country for breakup by having one group against the other group by telling them that your enemy is that other group, you see. So what you have to do is good universal education and then comparative market so that people have to do it on merit. That is the solution. I hear a lot of this thing in discourse today that uh, Hinduism has been Semitized. So there is a Semitization of Hinduism and we are becoming intolerant of other people's thought or thoughts of like within our same community we are becoming intolerant of thoughts which don't suit our own views and we become violent and we start banning books and we start uh, like uh, protesting and these court cases and especially like recently you have been uh, part of that discourse where one book was not actually banned, but was being withdrawn because it had some views on Hinduism. And I don't agree with that book, but again, I don't think banning is a good idea. And what are you, what are your thoughts on semitization okay. of Hinduism? Okay, there's several, first I have to disentangle several questions. Semitization is a separate issue. We don't like something, we can just say we don't like it. We don't have to, because semitized, semitized religions are the Judeo-Christian. So, is Hinduism being Semitized? Uh, I, I, I mean, that is a whole separate conversation. I would say Hinduism is being Semitized, nothing to do with picking up bad habits and becoming intolerant. Hinduism is being Semitized because, uh, you know, we are losing our distinctiveness. We, are, we don't understand what it means and we are defining ourselves in terms of Western, when we define Hinduism in terms of Judeo Christian categories, that is Semitization. So, when we translate Atman as soul, that is Semitization. Because soul does not have reincarnation, does not have no rebirth, no prana janam or next janam, soul. Soul, animals do not have, atma to even plants have. So, when you, when our guru has replaced the word atman in the book and called it soul, that to me is semitization. 
So, the problem of semitization is not what the rest of your question deals with. You see what I am saying? So, do not mix your problems. So, problem of semitization is a problem of translating the Sanskrit non translatables. I have a whole chapter in being different called Sanskrit non translatables means do not translate these because there is no equivalent word. If you translate these then the equivalent word that you are using is actually a distortion and you have semitized it. Okay. So, semitization to me is the translation of non translatables. So, that is a separate topic nothing to do with tolerant and intolerant. Okay. Now, the second issue is should we respect difference and different points of view and those who disagree with us. Of course, we should and that is not an issue that is not my problem with anybody. I have in the book invading the sacred documented dozens of times I have approached these other people to argue and debate with me. Even in this discussion today I wanted Laurie Patton to come and be the discussant with because I have she is the chair of religion or something like that here. She would not come because she has differences with me. She would not come. I am here. So, it is not that we do not like difference. I have had discussions with Mark Tully discussion on TV you can watch uh, with uh, Frank Clooney from Harvard. I have had very nice amicable disagreements and discussions and po point counterpoint with many westerners. Why is it that Wendy Doniger for 20 years will not come and discuss with me anywhere? I have said you tell me where television, Google, live I will come. No. I supported you on that. Okay, wait a second nobody want to come. So, firstly it is not that uh, do not mix it up with I am being intolerant no. Oh, no, wait a second. No, wait a second. I am just making my point. I am just explaining all my, I am separating all the issues into different categories, first of all. First of all, to set the record straight, I thrive on debate. I would love tonight to have been a debate. It is that the other side do not show up. Now, the other side do not show up because they have a privileged forum of prestige, okay, and by, but they do not have the same level of knowledge to argue back with me on our knowledge, on argumentation, on debate I can hold my own and do very well with them okay, in a live audience like this. They know that. I have hundreds of hours of YouTube, none of my views is a secret, it is open. I am, I am the most public in I got everything of I have to say, I say it openly. It is not like different things in different places. They know so much about me, therefore they are not able to come and just deal with me. So, if anybody is for stalling free speech, open discussion, it is those guys, it is not me. Yeah. So, my dispute has never been that a book is bad and it should be banned. My dispute has been I have a problem with the book, you should give my counter book. I am writing my own response in a book. I do not write a, a two page blog, I write a 400 page book. So, on Wendy Doniger, I wrote a book called Invading the Sacred and got many authors and many editors to contribute and it is it has been out since 2007. But why did not the same airport shops which are selling her books sell mine? Why did not the same publisher also uh, accept mine? Why is it that when I wrote to these publishers and said it will be very good to sell both books simultaneously, put her book and my, my uh, rebuttal side by side, they did not take it. Why? Because there are political reasons they would not take it. Why is it that on Suleika.com, which was the first portal I used to write, you know, I used to write on Suleika.com. When I wrote articles on Suleika.com, they used to rate the blogger. I was rated number one blogger of all Suleika for many years. When this art, this controversy started with uh, Wendy Doniger, her people could write an article in Washington Post. Front page, I was named front page Washington, I famous guy. I got people from all over the world calling me saying, you are on front page Washington Post. I said, oh, wow. Ah, ah. Front Washington Post would not take even one letter to the editor from me or anyone else and post it, whether not in the print and not in the online. Okay. And New York Times, another one of her students wrote an article. So, I am talking about abuse of power. It is a form of dictatorship. It is a form of control through uh, like we say Brahmins control the discourse in India. Well, these are the people controlling the discourse in the world uh, in the English language. You can call them Brahmins, Judo Brahmins, whatever you want to call it. But they, they, are, they have a privileged control of the discourse and they will not let others in. So, the question to ask somebody like Laurie Patton is not whether you agree or disagree. Do you agree with Rajiv's right to free speech? Do you agree that when Rajiv comes, you should come and have a chat for the sake of open discussion for why aren't you here when you have known for two months that he's coming why is she out of the country right now because she didn't want to be here
You should ask her that question. Okay, I'm telling you that. So I have a list of a large number of people I critique. I'm so open. In Indra's net, I have another 30, 40 people who are this, part of this neo-Hinduism camp. They think that Hinduism was invented by Vivekananda and didn't really exist. Things like that they are saying. I am naming them, quoting their arguments, giving my response. There is no insult, there is no threat, there is nothing abusive. It is just good, clear, logical scholarship based on hard facts. Some of their translations are wrong, some of their citations are wrong, some of their reasoning and philosophy is wrong. I am pointing out exactly like a technical person or a, a technical person would find bugs in a system or a scientific mind would find that the evidence wasn't right. This is exactly how I am doing it. And this is what the academic and intellectual people are supposed to be doing. So they are supposed to be uh, uh, the kind of person I am, but they are not, they are hypocrites. The problem really is there is an asymmetry of power. The publishing houses, uh, the ideology of the publishing houses supports a particular point of view. The ideology of mainstream media in India, the Hindu, Times of India, all these NDTV, they support a particular point of view. Yeah. So Sulekha, when I was writing things and when uh, these other people were, ha they had access to Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, all kind of places, C-SPAN, all these places they would come and give their thing and here I am writing a little blog here, a little blog there to give my answer. It is hardly, it is, the, the, it is disgraceful that a guy like me spent 20 years to get my point out, running around addressing groups. And these people can sit in the comfort of some nice Ivy Teague prestigious place, don't have to do much running around because they got a lot of cronies running around and popularizing their view. And they, will, they have a lot to lose facing me directly because they know that they, they will have a lot to lose. So it's like, you know, uh, the person who is the incumbent in power wants to ignore the challenger, wants to ignore the challenger. So the burden is on me to be non-ignorable. I, I have to raise the stakes so much and I have to make my critique so sharp that they can't afford to ignore me. So now I put them in a quandary. If we don't uh, respond to this guy, he keeps getting stronger, he keeps getting more followers, he keeps getting more courageous, he keeps digging up more stuff on us and publishing it, correct? And if we respond to him, actually we are playing into his game because then he becomes even stronger. So they don't know what to do. Do we ignore this guy or do we attack him back? They don't know what to do. And I wish they would attack me. I really wish they would attack me. So you see, this business of banning the book is not my style. I never wanted a book ban. I never asked for a book to be banned. I never, I, all I want is the equal right my book should be given. Now in the United States, when there's a presidential election and this and that, the rules are uh, media gives equal rights, equal rights, equal coverage. And the sitting president, when he makes a State of the Union address, the opposing side gets time to give a response. Media gives him time. Yeah? India, they don't do that. And even in the United States, uh, uh, what is applicable among the Westerners to each other is not applicable when a Hindu wants to get equal time. If I say, I just, I'm not asking you to be out, but I'm asking that I should get equal time to say about my own tradition in response to what you said about my tradition. I don't get that time. Try and see if in Duke you can get that time. You will, you will, you will fail or you and see you will fail. So the issue, the real issue here is a control of the distribution channels. It's like, you know, if Walmart and uh, uh, Target control so much percent of the retail shelf space for certain products and they say, you, we will boycott your product, you're finished. You can just set up a small shop in the side and sell a little bit. We will carry his product, whether it's the best or not, we we'll carry his product. Now that's an issue and that's an antitrust, anti-monopoly issue. If it happens in commerce that a particular, there is a monopolistic, uh, uh, you know, thing, privilege being given to a certain ideology and the opposing ideology is not being given equal play. If it were a commercial business corporate arena, then I could file a case on anti-monopoly against these guys. That's the case I would file. I wouldn't file banning them. I would file that they're trying to monopolize and not and deny me the equal access. But in this particular academic arena, there is no monopoly law. You can have a monopoly. That's the law. So, you know, I want you to understand how to frame the question. Okay. Now, the people who asked for 
banning, I did not uh, support that because I felt that uh, uh, better demand to the publisher would have been here is our 300 or 400 page response we want you to publish this also that should have been the response equal right that should have been our response but that you can't do if you're lazy you have to work hard you have to produce that you have to produce such a good one that it will withstand all the ammunition and all the attacks which will come right i do that these guys didn't do that because the easy way out was we just uh, raise some halla and yell and scream and bring it down i never done that okay Hello sir, good evening. My name is Padmohan and I'm a banking professional from Charlotte. Uh, my keen interest is in uh, mapping Hindu beliefs, cultures, traditions with modern day world logic. Um, so uh, I had a few concerns with respect to the discussion we had this, uh, this evening. Uh, I would like to stick to just the topic of Hindu contribution to modern day world. Uh, I fully agree with your views and uh, to add to that, uh, I read a few anecdotes uh, pertaining to uh, Ayurveda, uh, Indian medicine being imported to uh, Saudi Arabia, the Khalifa being treated by Indian physicians, uh, Indian metallurgy, uh, you mentioned about the zinc uh, thing, and uh, in addition to that, uh, that thing is the Meheroli iron pillar, which has uh, never, um, uh, apart from What's that, your question? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My question is that, uh, we all know of our glorious history, our traditions, and the world is recognizing it. But there was a time gap uh, of say some 100 years, we didn't recognize who we are, we were pretty ignorant. The world didn't recognize who Indians are, who, who Indian uh, beliefs are. So the question is, were we so ignorant uh, to our uh, legacy, or the world was too cruel or too jealous to recognize us for this duration? Why all of a sudden we are waking up on fine day and saying we are the best and we can do wonders? Well, firstly, we are not waking up. I don't think it, that there was a 100 year period which is go over. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think uh, the kind of thing I'm doing is a very, very tiny minority of people. I don't think uh, most of Indians have woken up. They may have some chauvinistic, bombastic thing, we are great and all that. But if you ask them substance, ask them facts, Read the books of history of India in India itself, you will find that they are not, they don't teach history of Indian science as part of Indian history. They don't teach history of Indian philosophy. They don't teach history of Indian medicine in medical schools. They don't teach history of uh, Indian technology in IITs. They do not teach all this in the India itself. So I don't think that this 100 year period of, uh, uh, you know, colonization is over. We are getting more colonized. In fact, if I have an e-group where we discuss all these things. Indians are getting more colonized, more enamored by uh, Western ways, Western aesthetics, not only loss of language, but also ideology, who are the best sellers in our media, all Western stamped people, uh, you know, academic scholars in India getting trained in the West, come back and teach. Uh, it's that sort of thing. So the, even the debates that I'm having on Hinduism, uh, we are not on the winning side in terms of uh, numbers. We are on the winning side in terms of merit of the argument. But what is selling? One book of mine sells, a thousand of theirs sell. Uh, mine sells in some, you have to go to flipkart.com and buy it and theirs you go to the airport and you buy it. It's sitting right there. There's a huge difference in, how, uh, you go to NDTV, this debate uh, that Wendy Doniger thing that broke out in the last two months, not a single Indian media brought me on the panel. Not a single Indian media. I wrote to so many of them. I can come by Skype. I was even present in India at that time. I was there for 40 days. Okay, no response to all the emails, you see. And I'm the guy, only person who started the whole controversy 10, 15 years ago when I wrote about Wendy Donald. I'm the only person who wrote a book in response to that. They should have at least said uh, as a courtesy that this guy has worked so hard. To, he's the person who instigated this whole thing which has turned into this controversy. Let's hear what he has to say, not one. Even the publisher who published Invading the Sacred, which was my, uh, my book in response to Wendy Doniger has gone to the other side and started publishing her books. And my earlier book, which was a bestseller, the father, Rajendra uh, Mehra, was the owner of Rupa. His son now owns it. So there's a change in, he's more on the other wavelength. He was a solid guy on my wavelength ideologically. 
So he, he, he was so happy with my book that it became a bestseller in India for two, three years. Sun comes, book is out of print. The publisher who made a bestseller out of it is refusing to republish it and make money in the light of this controversy. He would make a lot of money on this. Why? Because the phone rings, somebody from somewhere calls, somebody from the University of Chicago or somebody from somewhere calls and says, you know, don't promote this guy's books. We got all these new books coming, we'll give to you. So business talks. So I didn't complete the story on uh, Suleika. What happened and why I stopped writing on Suleika is because they were uh, told by some of their advertisers. The advertisers are all these like New York Life, Citibank, uh, you know, uh, American Express, all these kind of people put these big ads, you know, on the Indian blogs. So some people there, some Indian lobbied that you, the way this uh, publisher, this blogger, this uh, Suleika will listen, his name is Satya Prabhakar, he was the owner. The way he listen and throw this guy Rajiv out is if the advertisers call and threaten. So he then, uh, what he started doing is, every time I would write a blog, before my blog, would be for the opposing view click and they would give somebody this before. Normally it is after. Normally you listen to somebody and then you give the opposing view. But here to preempt them from reading my view, before you read my view, first you read what's wrong with it. This is what he started doing. Our own guy. So our people are sold out. Media sold out. Publishers sold out. Government people sold out. Um, education ministry, what books they are selecting sold out. So I don't see this that it was true for 100 years, sir, we are now back. We are not back. We are getting worse. So I, he actually asked the question that uh, I very much believe in, that uh, there was a Mughal period and then there was 100, 150 years, we missed out on the industrial revolution and then we became, like you said, loss of confidence or then we never picked up and like you said, I do believe that we have not come out of it. There are some ways, the NDTV, even IBM or all these news channels that are, the way they pose questions, they are not impartial. Mm. Uh, if you really pay more attention, you will come to know it. But at that particular point of time, you may not realize that, yeah, yeah this was a good question. So do you see any optimism that, um, it's going to be a gradual, there needs to be some kind of a counter um, other than promoting Hinduism that needs to bring it uh, See, I playing field. You yeah, so I would have preferred, I would have preferred if, uh, uh, if things hadn't gone so bad, uh, and I would have preferred a level playing field where all the faiths and traditions in the true spirit of Hinduism would coexist and uh, be given respect. But I think the anti-Hindu and the subverting the dharma forces have become so intense and so strong and so organized and so powerful, so hungry, so greedy and so vicious. They are all Hindu names only. So many, this Ramachandra Guha, then there is this one, all these kind of guys, you know, they are and they all paraded right and left, they are the icons, they go to this literary festival and they're given this award and they get, though there they get an award, like that, you know. So I don't know what's going to happen to India because that, this knowledge feeds media, then the whole portrayal of movies is like a certain way, uh, the portrayal through TV shows. So this mass uh, thing which is spreading, it has been really, uh, it has really polluted the English language world in India and the English language world is spreading, more English language jobs, uh, for matrimonial they want to be English speaking. In Punjab they are shutting down Punjabi schools and starting English schools. My mom's driver, 10 years ago when I used to go back, I used to say, you know, bring little gift for his children, they would all come, I would sit and say namaste, they would say oh, namaste, we would sit and eat together. Now when I say namaste, he tells his daughter, Sabko, good morning, bolo. And my mother was saying that uh, she runs a school for poor, uh, all the kids in the back, you know, she runs a school there. She's 89, she runs these things. So she says there's now a demand from all these Jogi Jombri people, driver servants, that uh, get rid of all these teachers and English sikhao. 
and uh, they want uh, the girl should be wearing the frock, the guy should be, the boy should be wearing a tie. They want their kids to grow up like Saab. So India is becoming like that. It's becoming more like that. You see, so you will find. Uh, uh, Sitting here, I feel that maybe I am getting more interest or maybe I have more time to get into the details. Like recently I got um, side of us, real side of us, Avrana, and in that you mentioned that like Gandhi and the book, uh, that book, uh, the judgment had a basis of, you know, it, it is not the content but it's more the intention and the facts. They were not. Yeah. So anyway, what, what we do is, uh, our people are not putting their money where their mouth is. I have worked way too hard for very little support and uh, people come and they show emotional support and they all, but they, you know, who then in the end actually comes through with it. I have very small percent of the people who are uh, vocal and supportive who will actually make the sacrifice, make the investment, try and help me out in a concrete way that can benefit this kind of a cause. So I am a barometer because I do, for 20 years I given every year between 100 and 150 events of this kind. I was in India, I had 45 events. Uh, in Washington I went in 4 days, I had 7 events. Here I have 2 events in 2 days. The next week I am going to Cornell, then I'm going, I have 2 events in Princeton, then here everywhere I am just Every year I am doing minimum 100 events up to 150 events every year for 20 years. I don't know anybody who has this record of so much interaction, involvement about this topic, this issue. Temples, universities I go to, corporate people I go to, civic groups I go to, political groups I go to, you name it I go. So I have a great uh, database of what is the thinking like here and in India both I do, a little bit of Canada. And I don't know anybody who's got this much database of what is the mindset. And I don't see, I see that a uh, lot of josh, but not substance behind it. Lot of josh, lot of what I call uh, uh, mouse clicking activism. <laughs> click, 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 mouse, usko bhejiya forward, tweet, 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 email, ha, sir, do this, sir, do this, sir, ha, like that. So I say, you do it, then go on, ha, that sort of thing. All wanting self-importance, everybody form a group, become officer, vice president, trustee, of, put their name in the letterhead, put on the blog side, home page, Hindu leader, that kind of a thing, just showing off. But where is the substance? I don't see that. I'm sorry to say, but if I were a Muslim or a Christian, I'd have no funding problem, I'd have no problem, there would be audiences 100 times bigger everywhere, yeah. The uh, average campus, New Jersey at least I've been to, when there's a Muslim event, it's a huge scale event. Every year they have an annual Muslim conference in Washington DC to make the point. They have a Washington DC, very prestigious hotels they say, it's in the summer, they have 10,000 people. Now we organize WAVES, which is World Association of Vedic Studies. Uh, after many reminders, sending money, sending tickets, this, that, we get 100, 150 people. Uh, we organized for 25 years, we've organized the uh, Vedanta Congress for academic, 25 years, we, I, I'm funding it, organizing it for a long time. Uh, 150 people, maybe 200 people show up. There are no shortage of people who start one more organization to become somebody, become important. And then they create a small little number of people saying the same old thing, regurgitating, they've said it 50 times, they've heard it here and there, copy paste, copy paste, say it again. You know, but nothing goes beyond it. So, gapshap, we are, it's gapshap. But beyond the gapshap, where are we? Where are the leaders? That is the thing. We, we, we need to create that thinking now. Otherwise, it won't happen. Even change in government, which I want, I, you know, I want that, I'm, I'm supporting. But what can one man do? You need a whole army of thinkers, leaders, there's department after department with corrupt after corrupt guy. You, where will you get such a huge uh, number of governance people, experts in, okay, you want to change HRD. 
HRD is not just one man either. HRD, all this thinking has gone down, you know, from kindergarten to schools, universities, this place, that place. It's all like that. I was invited to give a closed door session with Foreign Service Institute. Foreign Service are people where they, when they train the Indian Foreign Service, when they hire people who are going to become diplomats, ambassadors, people like that. So there is a batch of 30 people every year. The cream. So I gave them a talk. Very disappointed. Because I wanted to ask them that when a Japanese diplomat tells you about Japan history, he tells you about his greatness, his contribution. China will tell you about Chinese scientific contributions and this and that. You meet a Russian, he's very proud what it means to be Russian. Don't mix him with somebody else. French, he knows he's French. He's not German or English. He's French. He's not either mixed up. Yeah. Do you guys have a clear sense of who you are? What is your history? What is your distinctiveness? I was trying to inspire them. I would say one third were on my side. One third were neutral, confused, quiet. One third were very opposed. They were asking questions like the, the problems are talking breaking India. They are the breaking India type. They were asking questions like what do you mean the India story, Northeast as a separate story? If I'm a Dalit, I sh I, why should I think about India? I have my own problem as a Dalit. If I'm a Muslim, why should I, uh, wh what do you mean greatness of India? What, uh, what did it have to do with my ancestors? This is our people who are going to be our ambassadors, who are going to represent us. It's like a, a corporate guy finding out that uh, his own salesmen be don't believe in their product. Why are they salesmen? What are they going to do? So I said, I'm very sorry because when you grow and maybe you are in this idealistic uh, Indian intellectual, idealistic pseudo intellectual mode where you know too much self criticism is considered fashionable. But when you go out, you will find that diplomats of other countries are not like that towards their country. They are very patriotic. You may think it is out of fashion and it is a sign of being fascist and nationalistic and chauvinistic and they use words like sir, but do, aren't, aren't, isn't that going to be jingoistic? I said, no diplomat thinks that praising his country is considered jingoism. That jargon is Indian leftist jargon, which disease does not exist anywhere else. This is Indian guys, sir. I, have a, I had another closed door discussion with people who are supposedly very senior connected with national security. Closed door. Nobody allowed camera, camera, no this, that. Some are retired, some are not, you know, some are, but they are well placed. Similar conversation. One third. Very solidly, the guy who chairing it saying, I agree with everything you said. They were sitting on one side of this long thing. The other side, those guys completely opposed to what I'm saying, completely opposed. So India is polarized. The India, India's future in the, is India a nation? Does India, should India remain a nation? Should it be broken up? Is it, a, is it a can of worms? Is it a, is it a terrible thing that is called India that has been put together artificially by the British and should we should get rid of it. That very debate also, you will find a lot of people on both sides. This is and this matter is getting quite worse, quite quite bad. And, and the, you will find this problem with media people, intellectual people, for Indian foreign service people. My own uh, friends I grew up with long ago, you know, I'm now 63, but when I was like a teenager, people used to, I used to play with, they are in all these important positions. They are like this. They are saying, Raji, why are you fighting? Why you done well? You should go enjoy, get a beach house, go. Why are you worrying? Why should I worry? Why nobody worries? Nobody worries. Why are you worrying? And so if we go, if it happens, it happens. Who cares? This is the attitude of the who's who of Delhi. Delhi is a pretty uh, anti-nationalistic place. India is a, is a hub of this. So I, I, I'm being very honest with you, I tell you. I go to India four times a year. So you can't say I'm sitting here, I don't have a good connection. I'm more connected with India. I travel north, south, east, west. I go by trains, I go by buses, I live in villages. I do all of that. I'm more Indian, more connected with the soil than most people in India. And I'm telling you these things.